Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, and welcome um, on behalf of the RSNA and uh, the board and obviously the great staff and all the volunteers. We're, we're really glad that you could join us uh, today, and, and we're going to try to walk through just a quick explanation of, of what we're up to. Um, and I know that um, there's a lot of questions that have come up, and, and we expect those, so we're hoping to uh, set the stage for the process that we put together, and we appreciate everyone's uh, patience since the announcement. Uh, uh, you know, waiting for us to kind of get this all worked out. And we have a great system. We're really excited to share this with all of you. We hope that it makes uh, participating easy, collaborating with us easy, um, and that we can all participate in this, you know, very meaningful and worthwhile project. I'm just going to share a few slides um, to kick this off, and then I'll hand it over to my colleagues, uh, Eric Kolak from uh, Toronto and Felipe Kinamura from, uh, from Brazil. Let me just quickly share this. And that's all right. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Okay. Well, the the main question that we get, um, maybe more commonly than anything at this point, is what does Record stand for? That's that's the name of the database. Um, and so here you have it: uh, RSNA International COVID nineteen Open Radiology Database. Doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it is uh, it is probably our best bet to really describe what we're up to here, and it really is an open, collaborative, very international effort. And, and that's certainly the intent that we have here uh, for this work. So again, I'm just gonna give a couple uh, points about the project, what, why we're up to this and why we think this is an important en uh, endeavor, uh, and then just briefly touch on the plan. Um, and, and then I'm, again, I'm gonna hand it off to, to my colleagues to, to walk through some of the uh, protocol and the process here. Um, again, my name is Matt Lunger and I'm from Stanford. I'm the task force chair volunteer and I'm really excited to, again, be a part of this. We, we talked about doing this uh, fairly early on uh, during the pandemic. We've been uh, working with data from multiple institutions at the RSNA uh, as part of the machine learning committee. And many of you may be familiar with the challenges that we've hosted uh, over the past few years. And um, we've, we believe we've developed a system where we really are helping to try to advance uh, the field in terms of research and education around important clinical problems in radiology. Um, and when this uh, pandemic began to really take shape, it was very clear to us uh, that radiology would be on the front lines, uh, whether, uh, whether we thought we would be ready or not. And, um, and it's very important that we uh, attempt to share and, and disseminate knowledge in a way that we believe will be uh, useful for everyone. And so uh, we know that there are many institutions that have many different cases on, on different types of imaging examinations. Uh, we've focused, at least initially, for the purposes of this uh, uh, initial release on chest imaging, uh, focusing on CT and X-ray, and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about those modalities and, and sort of why we chose those and how those might look. Um, but we do recognize that um, this is a fluid and dynamic pandemic. Um, and it has uh, certainly affected all of us in different ways and at different times. And our hope is that this database is not just a one-time uh, sort of relationship. This is uh, meant to be an ongoing relationship. In other words, that we curate a large data set and with our colleagues um, at the Society of Thoracic Radiology, we have the opportunity to, uh, to annotate these data um, and then make them available uh, via a wonderful partnership that we've developed with uh, the NIH uh, TCIA, the Cancer Imaging Archive, and that will allow um, that will allow users from around the world to access this annotated uh, COVID-specific data set uh, without any cost to them. And and again, the hope is that um, a, a very large um, data set from multiple institutions will really give the opportunity to uh, to sort of avoid some of the, the, the pitfalls of data sets that are um, from one institution or one group alone, and really allowing us to sort of capitalize on the resources and the knowledge that uh, I think all of us are learning as we go uh, throughout the world. And so again, the, the uh, goal here is to sort of help walk all of you through uh, how you can contribute and collaborate with us on this important endeavor. Uh, I wanted to emphasize again that this is uh, basically the initial steps and that we anticipate that over the next four to six months, uh, we will be releasing more and more data as it comes in, as it's annotated, 
Um, we are uh, planning to expand the types of studies uh, beyond the initial uh, chest imaging. Um, and we are planning to also expand into sort of the data element range as well in terms of the clinical data that might be available. But for now, our goal is really to put together a very high quality data set um, that, um, that is highly uh, and carefully annotated by our expert sub-specialty radiologists and then make that available as a first offering as soon as possible. And so our really, our, we're, we're pushing to get this first release done uh, by the end of the month uh, in July. And, um, and then beyond that, we will have subsequent releases to add and enrich that data set. Um, again, I mentioned that this has really been a response to the pandemic. I think that we um, have a, a unique position at the RSNA where we have informed many collaborations with institutions around the world and other uh, imaging societies, um, including our colleagues in Europe and Asia um, and throughout the world. And, and I think this has really been a, a wonderful opportunity for us to, to sort of put together this repository uh, with the resources and relationships that we have. Um, I like to sort of relate this to the uh, the spirit of the initial uh, release of the genome of the of the COVID-19 virus, where um, scientists who first isolated it were able to make it available basically uh, as soon as they had sequenced it. So rather than sort of sequencing it and then kind of holding it as a uh, as a competitive advantage in a scientific in a scientific sense to uh, to create the first vaccine, for example, rather than do that, they actually simply released the genome, and that, that's really allowed. Uh, the scientific advancements to flourish um, around the world where you see many different vaccines, many different therapies being tried. Uh, and all of this has really been on an accelerated pace. And I think that the catalyst to this accelerated pace has really been the fact that um, there's been a very much a spirit of open science here. And that's really what we want to, uh, want to continue with this database as well. Um, we do believe that deep learning and AI may have a role here. Um, this database is not specifically for that, but it has been designed such that um, it would be better to, uh, to develop tools using this database uh, in the sense that it avoids some of the biases that can occur uh, when data is trained on limited small data sets or data sets from only one institution. Uh, but in addition, we believe that there's a major education opportunity here uh, to really spread the knowledge that, that we've gained from, from the work that we're all doing on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, so again, um, we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the tools that we've built, the protocols that we've put together, and the pathway for submission. Um, we are continuing to receive interest and, and data set uh, 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 contribution uh, offers uh, for, for what we're doing, and, and we're very delighted to have all this uh, support, and, and we, we really thank all of you that are joining us today and, and watching this later. Uh, because this is, again, one of the most important efforts that, uh, that I've certainly been a part of in my career, and I think a lot of folks on our task force agree. Um, we will be collecting and aggregating data again, and we'll be staging it on our side for the annotation work. And again, that's a partnership with the Society for Thoracic Radiology and volunteers there. Um, we have developed use case specific labeling protocols, and that has not been done just at the RSNA. We've actually been doing that in conjunction with um, imaging societies from around the world. Uh, in particular, the group uh, led by Eric Ranchard in Europe, but, but others, and really trying to line up the labels that we're annotating and the methodologies that we're using to annotate so that if you have a model that uh, maybe you use to uh, develop on, uh, um, on the record database, it may be still applicable uh, in, in other databases that, that are being worked on uh, in the sense that the labels will, will line up, and that's, that's been important to us. Um, we, again, will have this data uh, made available in a way that is open science um, and for research and education. Again, the NIH has um, uh, offered to host this as part of their TCAA. You may, many of you may be familiar with uh, the data sets that they host there uh, with, an, with eventual expansion into, into sort of more uh, long-term hosting opportunities. And, and, and again, we'll, we'll be keeping all of you posted on, on where those go, but for now, we have a wonderful partnership with MD.AI and the NIH right now for, for this workflow. Um, and then finally, we are uh, working towards, as we build and develop this data set, we're working towards uh, developing challenges that can engage uh, a broader uh, community of researchers around the world towards uh, helping us solve some of these clinically important problems around COVID. Uh, and some of that will be even further enriched with, uh, with, with clinical data um, as, we'll, as we'll describe. 
this is a graphic that maybe you've seen before. Um, and if not, it's really meant to attempt to simplify sort of the different steps that are involved. Um, and, and really, it, it's the kinds of things that you'd imagine would be here. Um, certainly, we're working towards aggregation and collaboration, and that's sort of where this uh, initial webinar kind of comes in. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the de-identification tools that we've created that we hope will be very useful to you and, and straightforward to use. Um, we'll talk about data transferring, um, which is how to securely make sure that that data is uh, is able to make its way towards uh, our, our database at the RSNA, and we have different options available for that as well. Um, I mentioned a little bit about our annotation and curation, and that's something that's going on actually in parallel to this effort. We've already received uh, many hundreds uh, of imaging studies already from some of our initial partners, and, and we're excited to start annotating that, and that is ongoing. And then finally, a user access approach, which really um, simplifies sort of the user agreement and registration components, um, and then making that data available uh, for research and education. So with that, um, I will uh, hand it over to Errol uh, Kolak, uh, who's going to talk about data inclusion criteria. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So first, let's uh, talk about the COVID positive scans. So the inclusion criteria are patients over the age of 18. In our initial batch of data, we're looking for chest CTs or radiographs. Um, if a study is a chest CT with part of the abdomen or pelvis as part of that accession, that's okay. And we'd like the infection to be confirmed by uh, RT-PCR, a positive antibody test, or if there are any local clinical diagnostic uh, criteria that are set by a hospital institution. In terms of these patients, um, these patients may have had a positive test and they were hospitalized with symptoms, uh, or if the test uh, was turned positive during a hospital admission, or if they're hospitalized and symptomatic, and then a, a short-term follow-up test shows that they were positive for infection, we would consider all these as patients that are positive. In terms of chest CTs, any protocol is acceptable. So with or without contrast, CTPAs, it doesn't matter. Uh, we are looking for axial series images only. Uh, we prefer the mediastinal or soft tissue window kernel. And if possible, slice thicknesses between two and a half and five millimeters. This makes the annotation process easier. If, however, you only have thin slice images, that's okay. In terms of chest x-rays, any protocol is okay and any method of acquisition. So whether they're portable studies, um, if it's an AP projection, PA or lateral, those are all okay. The minimum data elements we're looking for, and a lot of these will be generated with the de-identification de tool that uh, Felipe will speak about shortly, is a de-identified patient ID, accession number, the age of the patient, gender, and their COVID uh, status. There is a spreadsheet that's available on the web website. I'll show you in a sec what this looks like. There are some optional data elements which would be useful. And if you could provide these to us through that spreadsheet, that'd be fantastic. So these would include uh, BMI, uh, when the patient, if the patient was symptomatic, when the symptoms started with respect to the initial baseline study, and there's a variety of other clinical parameters there. This is a screenshot of that spreadsheet. It's very small. We'll, we'll put this on the website shortly the de-identification tool will generate uh, a type of spreadsheet and you could copy and paste the part of that into this spreadsheet and then uh, upload that to us in terms of the covid negative patients they're going to have negative confirmation testing otherwise the process is the same as the positive patients so we'll chest cts or radiographs any protocol for the cts axial um, series mediastinal kernel and two and a half to five millimeter slice thickness is preferred. And I'll hand over to Felipe. We wanted to make sure that we are able to keep uh, patient data uh, anonymized uh, to, um, so the thing is uh, there are multiple uh, the identification tools that we could use, but um, we would suggest if you want to that uh, you use RSNA's the identification tool because it's been there for a while. It's been uh, developed uh, uh, for a few years and it's quite safe. 
But uh, we do know that our other the identification tools that you may want to use. So one thing that this uh, specific uh, protocol, the identification protocol does, is we just switch some PHI for pseudo values. And this uh, replacement is done in a deterministic way. So we can still track patients across time if, you, if we want to. And also, if we want to know if a specific chest X-ray is from uh, the same uh, patient as another uh, chest CT, we can also do that. Another thing that is also done, which is pretty cool in this tool, is that um, the dates are also shifted, so they are uh, anonymized. But this shifting is also uh, deterministic depending on the patient ID. So uh, again, we are able to track patients over time and see what are the time intervals between scans uh, for the same patients. So this is uh, what we chose, but you can also use different tools if you want to. It's just that it's quite easy to, to use. So this is the screen from uh, the tool I'm, I'm uh, describing. It's called RSNA Anonymizer. Um, it's free. You can download it on our SNA website, uh, and it implements this de identification protocol that I've just uh, described. It's Java based, which means you can run uh, locally in your computer, uh, regardless of the operating system you have. And it also can be used uh, not only to de identify data, but also to uh, query and retrieve data from your packs. Uh, you may have to uh, have. Uh, some credentials to do that and talk to the PAX admin of your institution. But uh, once you do that, you can put those credentials here uh, as parameters in this uh, program, and then you can query for specific studies. One interesting thing is that if you have already uh, filtered the studies you want to uh, retrieve from your PAX and you have a list of accession numbers, you can put that list of accession numbers here, and then it will retrieve and also de-identify all those studies automatically for you. Um, so after you have um, extracted those studies from the packs and de-identified, uh, the last step is to send this data to the RSNA um, uh, website that is uh, the staging platform called MDAI. Uh, and so there are three main steps. You have to get your data from your packs, you have to de-identify it, and then you have to send it to MDAI. You can use this same tool for uh, all these three steps, but you can also do it in a different way. If you have a different way to extract your studies from uh, your packs, you can use this anonymizer only to de-identify your data and send it to MDAI. Or also, uh, if you already have your data extracted and de-identified, there are three different ways you can send it to MDAI. One of them is using the DICOM send uh, tool in this uh, anonymizer tool. Another one is just doing a web upload, which is quite uh, standard, like any website. And another one is this command line interface, if you are comfortable with using command line. We usually suggest to use command line if you have a huge amount of data that would otherwise uh, break one of the two other options. But what we've seen is that even with large amounts of data, the web upload and also the DICOM send usually works well. Uh, so I think this is the main idea of the data handling part. And now I'm gonna hand off to uh, Chris Carr, who is gonna uh, talk to us uh, about the record web page. Thanks. Thanks, Felipe. Um, so uh, I will want to show first the um, web resources. So on the rsna.org website, um, all of the materials that we have presented today are available and linked. Um, so the home page is the uh, for record on the rsna.org site is the one listed here um, and we will 
um, you know, share these slides with the group through our, um, our Google group discussion list. Um, and uh, there's a link here, the circle link in the navigation bar for record resources. Um, and that page looks like this. And it's the one that includes um, kind of the process description for how to submit uh, data, how to, how to kind of engage with record and take the steps necessary to submit data. Um, and it uh, has the documents we've been looking through and other tools and materials. So the, the data inclusion criteria that Errol walked through, um, the data de-identification protocol document that Felipe talked about and the um, DICOM anonymizer tool are both linked here as well. And uh, there is also a, an instructions document for using anonymizer. Um, and there is a, a data submission agreement, which I will talk about in just a minute, um, uh, and uh, a description of the data transfer process. Um, so the, those um, tools that uh, enable you to send data to the MDAI uh, staging platform. Um, and so all of that is linked here. Uh, there's also an FAQ, which I, I didn't include here, but there's a, a separate link for an FAQ document in it, and it um, uh, provides, you know, some answers to general questions about uh, record and, and gets down into some of the details of um, uh, related to the steps we've been talking about, um, selection, de-identification, submission. Um, so just to take a minute to talk about the data submission agreement, um, it's kind of the first step in getting engaged, or we could say the first transaction. I guess the first step was um, uh, expressing your interest in becoming part of this project. Um, but in order to submit data, you have to first submit the signed data submission agreement. Um, it's based on the Cancer Imaging Archives Agreement uh very pretty much identical in its terms um, and it is you know premised on the idea that what we're sharing is uh data from which protected health information has been removed so de-identified data um, and it uh in order you know to what you're consenting to is to make your data available freely available uh, for commercial, scientific, and educational purposes. And that um, language, again, is uh, the language that's used by TCIA, the Cancer Imaging Archive. And it's very much um, aligned with the goals of this initiative to make data available to the research community and to foster the development of real clinical tools based on that data. Um, and the, the specific language of the end user agreement, so the agreement that users of this data um, will ultimately have to agree to before they get access to it is also available for your review there. And, and the, the terms of it are very much complementary with the data submission agreement. Um, so with that, I think that covers, uh, you know, the information we had prepared specifically to, to present to you today, but really we want very much to hear your questions and to see um, what additional things we can provide that would help you participate and kind of um, uh, accelerate the launch of this project. Um, so can we open it up now for questions and answers? So Chris, do you want me to read from the Q&A or did you want to open it up and I'll filter questions? Sure, yeah, we can start from questions that have been submitted through the, the, uh, sure. the chat. Yeah, so the first question says, regarding inclusion criteria, how about RT, PCR plus, but, but not hospitalized? I, th I would say that's acceptable, absolutely. Okay. And then uh, the next question says, can we include digitized hard copy chest x-rays? I would say yes, as long as there's no PHI burnt onto the image. OK. 
Okay, and then Chris, this might be a question for, for us. Um, how would those interested in um, accessing the data sign the agreement? Are we accepting a digital signature or um, hard copy signature and, and sent to us? I'm maybe yeah. not elaborating on the question, but that's my interpretation of the yeah. question about the agreement. So the agreement is a, a PDF form that should enable you to add an electronic signature and submit it. Um, but if there's another method that you're um, more comfortable using or that your institution generally uses, we'd be open to sending the document to you in a different format and gathering the signature in whatever way is most uh, convenient for you. And I guess a follow-up question to that, Chris, even though it wasn't explicitly asked, but I'm asking for those on the call, um, who would be the signer? Would it be the, um, the hospital, the authority figure in a hospital or the institution? Yes, so um, the, there needs to be a signature from an authorized signatory, somebody who is, um, whose position allows them to um, you know, to commit the institution, bind them to the policies that are expressed in the agreement. Um, there's also a signature optionally from the um, uh, principal investigator at the institution. That's, you know, uh, according to the institution's policies, whether or not they need the, the PI to sign the agreement as well. There's a question here. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. Uh, question is, I understand the negative cases are optional, right? Instead of RT-PCR negative, can we submit chest x-rays from before November 2019? That's the strategy I've used for my contribution to the data set. I think it's a lot easier, and I think it's probably a more convincing negative test. So I think that's, I would use that strategy. Yeah, I want to also second that, Errol. And uh, you know, the the idea is that you know, for any site who wants to participate, uh, the COVID positive chest imaging is is pretty much the the base the baseline uh, data that we're looking for, and probably the most useful. But um, I think ideally, we would like to have um, COVID negative cases, certainly that you're testing negative, but have imaging. But then also, the best control is. And hi, K man, how are you? <laughs> Um, those, are, those are actually the cases that um, would be much more uh, convincingly negative, uh, given that some of we've seen some problematic issues with the PCR test. So that would be fantastic to have historical cases that are certainly negative, particularly if they have findings of uh, pneumonia and other kinds of lung infection uh, in order to really have a nice uh, control set. Um, I'll also mention that um, on that record website, you can peruse this a little bit. But you'll see that um, we have a list of optional data elements as well. Not everyone's going to have those data available right away, certainly. Um, and but if you do, great, because that's that's obviously really helpful uh, for enriching the data set and making it even more useful uh, as you know a clinical and education uh, data sampling. Uh, but you know, for for us, I think the basic bare minimum are the are the cases that you have uh, that are COVID. Uh, tested and positive or negative in that sense. Felipe, you want to take the question about the uh, deterministic conversion? Yeah, so that's a good question from Kim uh, as well. So, um, yeah, there's always this um, a concern that people uh, will be able to convert back to the real PHI, but this specific uh, RSNA uh, anonymizer, what it does is to create a sequential integer uh, that is the patient ID. So it starts with one and then goes to two and then three. Um, it also generates a table where you can uh, match the real and the fake IDs. This table is only uh, available for the person who de-identified the data. So as long as you don't share the table, it's not possible to revert back and find the real PHI. Then a related question, can RSNA anonymize or de-identify and save locally without uploading to MDAI? I have to go through a third-party partner before uploading to MDAI. 
I'll, I'll leave that to you, Felipe. Yeah, uh, so yeah, definitely. So RSNA uh, anonymizer can be used both to retrieve images from your facts, but you don't uh, have to use it for that as well. Uh, if you already have your data locally, you can use that anonymizer to de-identify your data and you can upload it by other means because uh, once it de-identifies your data, it saves, uh, it persists the, the DICOM in a specific folder in your computer, in your local computer, and then you can use a different uh, tool to upload to MDAI. I see a question about um, IRB. Um, yeah, we definitely um, have all, I think everyone who has contributed uh, already has uh, gotten permissions from their IRB about the process. We're happy to sort of answer questions that they may come back with um along the way but uh, but yes we we would certainly encourage you to use that uh existing framework within your institution to you know gain the necessary approvals um again recognizing that it's uh, dependent on where you are in the world and your own institutions uh but for the most part our uh our irbs have been fairly um, uh, good about moving this quickly because of the urgency of the disease and certainly the, the importance of this initiative. There's a, another question yeah. kind of related, Matt. Uh, is there a deadline for sending the agreement document? We are waiting for the verdict of our ethics committee. Um, yeah, great question. And we've all been part of um, committees or waiting uh, for committees and that's certainly uh, not a problem for us. I don't think that we will turn anyone away. Um, as I mentioned before, there are going to be several releases of this database um, and uh, contributions can be made throughout that period. And, and at the moment, we don't have an end date. So in other words, uh, it's, it's relatively open. And, um, and certainly if your committee uh, takes a little time, that's, that's absolutely fine. We wouldn't put you in a position where uh, you have a drop dead deadline. We, we would um, need the agreement before we can receive data just to make sure that we're all following the right processes. Um, and as long as your institution has, has approved that. I don't know if Felipe met, uh, mentioned this, but with the DICOM anonym anonymizer tool, if you can use images that you've manually extracted from packs with it. So um, if you feel more comfortable going to packs, selecting a particular series and saving that to your hard drive, you could then uh, use DICOM anonymizer, point to that folder on your computer and it'll process them without a problem. I think that's all the questions that were submitted via the Q&A panel. Um, is there anyone else who's got a question they'd like to raise? Doesn't sound like it. Oh, I got a new question from Kim and hey. Uh, it's do the ethics committees in your institutions handle projects like this that do not have specific research objectives? Well, it's interesting because um, at least in the states, uh, once data has been uh, completely anonymized um, and is no longer sort of under the HIPAA uh, sort of a regulation here, it, it actually does make it so that the IRB it, it would call it exempt research um, so that you know it enables the transfer and, and of, of data that's not uh, that has no PHI identifiers. We um, we still submit to our IRB here and again I know this is going to be very institution specific so uh, please you know consult with your own local groups but for the most part we do that just to make sure that we haven't overlooked something and to make sure that we can go back and say uh, you know, here is exactly what we did. Here are the folks that had a chance to review what we've what we've done, um, and kind of keep it so it's not um, everything's very transparent. Um, part of that's going to be covered just in the data agreement uh, signing. So you know, again, there when that institution representative is you know, or it's a committee or whoever needs to uh, needs to authorize that that you can do this. There is certainly. 
um, an aspect of having an IRB exemption that can make that easier. Um, but you know, truth be told, I believe there are, there are many institutions that would say that this is not um, uh, under the purview of the IRB in, in some scenarios in the sense that there's not PHI and this isn't a specific human subject research project. My experience in Canada was very similar where the IRB deferred to privacy, but I still put an IRB proposal in just to, just for the coverage and just to be certain. And mo at least my institution was very uh, progressive and processed everything quite quickly just because it's COVID and it's, uh, it's such a global problem. So I anticipate most institutions will be uh, willing to process this quickly and understand the significance of this project. Looks like we've got a question from Carlos. Um, how much time do we have to submit the data? Again, for you know, from my perspective, and I think I can speak on behalf of the rest of the committee. You know, again, this is this is meant to be a kind of an ongoing uh, uh, sort of project with again multiple releases, multiple additions to the data set. So if it takes you additional time, that's fine. Um, I will also point out that we are annotating in a highly detailed way a lot of these studies, which um, ultimately is going to be the bottleneck and not necessarily the, the submission of the data, as it turns out. And so, um, as you can imagine, in parallel, we have a whole separate workflow and process for, uh, for, for expert annotations of this data set. Um, and that actually will likely take longer than many of you to, to sort of gather the approvals to submit data. Um, so, so recognize that while we are uh, certainly ready to receive the data and we're ready to go, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be ready right now either. Um, but, uh, but we're here to sort of open this, uh, you know, obviously this webinar, but then certainly ongoing discussions to help support you. Um, and if things start to hit a snag or you have issues in the future, we're here to support and potentially uh, work with you in, in any way we can to make sure that you're able to submit and contribute. I see a question from Jonathan um, about citing the data set. Um, and I can I can take that one um, in um, publication of the data on TCIA. Uh, there will be um, simultaneously or close to simultaneous with that um, publication of a data resource article, um, either probably in uh, radiology AI or in um, nature. Uh, data science, which is the, the journal that um, uh, TCIA uses, and uh, it, that will generate a document object identifier. And uh, the when you use the data, you just you simply need to reference the data resource article associated with the data set. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. But. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd mentioned that um, everyone contributing um, data will be recognized. Uh, we'll have um, all of this sort of archived on a, on our web page and at RSNA, and then we'll obviously be continuing this collaboration with all of you and your institutions because I think that this would be the beginning of a relationship uh, as we begin to build out some of these other efforts. I mean, COVID is certainly an incredibly important use case, but I think in general, open science is something that we all strongly believe in and uh, opportunities to sort of use this as a use case uh, towards developing more open science. I think we can all agree is, a, is an important and, uh, and probably urgent goal of ours. And um, and so that, that would go into that. So uh, as collaborators, um, uh, it's an ongoing relationship and we expect again to recognize uh, those groups that are contributing here but then also to continue that relationship such that you know we can continue to work together for for future projects there's a question here about file format uh what would happen if the file is not in DICOM I think it's better for the quality of the data set to limit ourselves to DICOM file format it's a lot easier the data is more richer and there's another email from Ioana uh regarding additional questions, uh, feel free to email me. I'll help you if I can. Yeah, and we'll put a link to the uh, discussion board, um, which I think because of all the time zones that we're all in, um, some of us are drinking coffee, some of us are drinking wine probably right now. Um, I think that that'll give us an opportunity to sort of answer them in an asynchronous way, but to support each other so that we have many different task force volunteers that can help you. And then hopefully as we all learn the process, we can help each other. 
Chris, do you want to make a question from Alfredo about uh, is it mandatory to send the end user agreement? Uh, Chris, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, the, the end user agreement is for um, researchers who are using the data. So uh, it doesn't, if you're submitting data to be included in record, you don't need to, to um, sign the end user agreement. It's just provided really for your reference. Um, researchers who are using record will have to submit that before they get access to the data. Chris, there's another question for you. How many institutions have expressed interest in participating in this project? So um, somewhere around 230 total institutions um, replied to our survey and expressed interest in, in, uh, in sharing data. From, I, I, I didn't, I, I don't have the current tabulation of the countries, but it was a very impressive number uh, and included um, every continent except Antarctica, of course. And then to Juana's question, we will provide, as, as Matt said, the, the link to the discussion board and we all track that and we'll respond to questions through that discussion board. Yeah, and then I think that it's also important to note that, you know, for those of you out there who are interested in being even more involved, um, we would welcome that. Uh, everyone you see here on the screen is a volunteer, um, except for Chris. Sorry, Chris. Chris works for the RSNA. But the rest of us are volunteers. And um, I, I think we've all devoted a significant amount of time because how strongly we believe in this uh, effort. And, um, and so for those of you out there that may feel the same way, um, we would certainly welcome uh, more participation from you or or folks like you. So so please spread the word that this is uh, meant to be the beginning and not uh, a one off event. And so we we would look for more collaboration as, as this begins to unfold and, and as we build this data set. Well, I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. Is there any other questions out there? Again, this will be recorded and archived. Um, you should have an opportunity to, again, to continue to communicate with us. We'll provide that uh, information. Uh, you can obviously email us um, and then uh, hopefully uh, we'll make this process as smooth and as uh, straightforward as possible. Chris, do you want to put an email in the, yeah, a, a general contact information? Great. Um, sure. Yes. Um, the, the, we will distribute the slides um, through the discussion list, the, the Google group discussion list. Um, if you have not received, if you do not receive them, or if for some reason you don't think you are subscribed to the Google group, uh, we, I will, am providing an email here through the, um, the Q and A board that you can use for any questions um, related to this project. It's just informatics at rsna.org. And with that, maybe we can wrap up today's session. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chris, Jamie, for setting this up. Uh, thank you, Felipe and Errol, again, for uh, for your contributions and for coming and, and hosting this webinar with us. Um, on behalf of the RSNA, I, I really want to say thanks to all of you uh, for making this possible. It, it, again, more than 200 plus institutions contributing. Uh, it's not only an opportunity, again, to explore what we can do together, but, uh, but really an opportunity to build these relationships. So I'm really excited uh for this i hope that this uh does impact the world and and shows the uh, the benefits and and potentially the the way that we could advance science uh, with this sort of open source approach so i really thank all of you for your efforts i know it won't always be easy um but i i, I know that you can do it um and we're here to help um and please reach out if you have any further questions uh we look forward to, to working with all of you